Hello everyone, this is episode 5 and today we are discussing brand strategy with Ron Coughlin. Ron is going to be sharing with us today his experience developing integrated brand marketing solutions while he was the head of marketing for brands such as Tim Hortons, Dairy Queen, Toronto Pearson International Airport, and Destination Ontario. Today, Ron operates his own brand marketing agency, Branded, while educating future marketing professionals at Humber and Centennial College in Toronto, Ontario. You're listening to the Merged Marketing Podcast with David Louch and Jason Hunt. This is a show all about unlocking the marketing tactics and secrets behind everyday brands. Each week, we'll bring you expert commentary so that you can make better choices when it comes to growing your business. Thank you for spending time with us. Now let the show begin. Okay, and we're live. Thank you for tuning in and welcome to this week's show. Jay and I are super excited for today's episode as we have our friend and colleague Ron on the show who is going to be sharing with you some incredible stories from his career. Ron, welcome to the show. Hi, Dave. How are you doing? Hi, Jay. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. Oh, my pleasure, guys. How's your week going so far? Well, it's going well. I'm just about to teach one of my uh, digital marketing classes at Centennial College. So this is a good time to, to talk to you guys prior to the class. Awesome. That's great. Okay. So um, today uh, we're going to be discussing brand strategy, obviously. Uh, but before we get into that, Ron, can you please share with, with us and, uh, and our listeners um, a little bit about, about you? So your backstory, maybe where you're from, um, how you got into marketing, if you knew that you were, uh, you were born for it or interested in it from an early age. Just, just I guess, your origin story on who, who Ron Coughlin is. Sure. So um, I'm, you know, I'm a Toronto uh, native and grew up here. Uh, I went to the University of Toronto and actually did a kinesiology degree, but in the middle of it, realized that maybe it wasn't the thing I wanted to do, but maybe sport marketing was. And I actually ended up um, taking a summer job as a franchisee with College Pro Painters, which was one of the best things I ever did because it taught you how to run a business, how to do marketing, how to market your business, how to sell, how to operate the business. And the side that I really enjoyed the most was um, doing the marketing. And actually, the way they marketed, it wasn't social media back there, was we put a lot of signs up on past customers. And so we had a big job on John and Young Street, which is a very popular tra high traffic area. And we had, I took all my staff and all my crew and we started painting this house. We had three signs up. And within two days, I had calls to the office of over 200 estimates. <laughs> so. So that really worked. And I realized um, uh, that I needed to do something to drive leads. And so what I did is I started a separate company called Rapid Lead. And I hired some other students to knock on doors and do cold calling and get estimates for me for painting. And that ended up being so successful. I was able to book up the whole summer by the end of May. All my jobs I exceeded. I became a star manager. And then I used uh, that company rapidly. I, I kind of marketed it to the other franchisees, and they started hiring my company, which was run by a friend of mine, Mark Mercy, and my sister, Kim. And we ended up making a pretty good buck just knocking on doors and getting leads for individuals. And today, we wouldn't do that. Obviously, we'd use the internet and, and other <laughs> means, but uh, it was so, something that I felt was really exciting. So I realized very quickly I liked marketing and I went back to university in the University of Calgary because the Olympics were on, uh, the Calgary <laughs> Olympics, and Convenient. started my master's degree. Um, and I did a kind of a focus in communications and in sport marketing, which was my passion because I love sport. And I got a job actually right away after that uh, with the back at my old alma mater, University of Toronto. And I was the marketing promotions manager for the University of Toronto Varsity Blues and the Athletic Center there and all the programs. And because it was the big school where a lot of the big national events happened, I also helped launch the and change the Vanier Cup, which is the CIAU, which is now Canada U Sports, CIA Sports. Uh, we put the Vanier Cup from used to be in the uh, Varsity Arena, sorry, Stadium, University Stadium, not the arena, uh, into the Sky Dome. And so I had a great kind of fun time there. And very quickly, I realized I loved this. And another company came after me, which was the World Basketball League, which was starting up 
so an international league, which I became their director of marketing. As time went on, I left the, the sport marketing arena and became an agency guy, I worked for BBDO. Um, and then I worked there for about 10 years, ran some very large accounts like Dairy Queen, um, Salvation Army, Petro Canada, uh, Molson's, uh, Talbot's. Um, then I got headhunted away to, to run the McDonald's business as the VP client service director at Cassette Advertising. Uh, a very large account. I had a staff of almost 50 people, account people, media people, strategic people, a, di a division of the internet uh, where we were building their main website. Um, and it was quite a fascinating role. And I actually uh, uh, got to meet a, one of my, I guess, idols at the time, which was Wayne Gretzky. We did three spots with him and got to know him pretty well. Um, I left there uh, uh to run um, uh, and help launch uh, a company called Palladium. Do you guys know Palladium in Canada? Of course, of course, yeah. Yeah. So, many yeah, so right now there's not a lot of locations, but when I was there, there was two locations and we had a plan to build another 10 across Canada and then expand in the US. We ended up building locations in Edmonton, Vancouver, and we did a partnership, which I put together with, uh, a, uh, which, which was Cineplex Studios, or cinemas, I should say, where we did plenty of tech towns in the various cinemas as well. Um, that was going fine and dandy for about two years, but what happened was they started to run out of money. So and they weren't paying the ad agency, so our agency, which was a real drag for me being an old agency guy. So a friend of mine who was head of marketing at Dairy Queen said, hey, I'm." he was now head of marketing at Wendy's, said, which owned Tim Horton, said, hey, there's a role here as the director of marketing uh, and specifically the regional marketing. Uh, would you be interested? I said, absolutely. And I got the job and I started, actually, it was one of the uh, most fascinating roles I ever had because I got to work on some really cool programs, including Camp Day and, uh, and helped create the Timbit sports program, which many of you probably have been a Timbit hockey or soccer player. Um, so that was a pretty cool initiative. And then my old client called me and said, hey, we're the Dairy Queen. They were bought by Warren Buffett, said, how would you like to be the VP of marketing for Dairy Queen for North America? I said, oh, that's not a bad gig. So I left Tim Hortons, which was hard to do, uh, to become the, 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 the guy to reshape the brand at Dairy Queen. Um, that was a fascinating role. Got to uh, do a brand strategy, got to do a lot of research, got to reinvent the the brand into two different brands, a food brand called DQ Grill and Chill, and then a treat brand, um, created some award-winning advertising, um, and it was quite fascinating. Um, I left that to uh, go work for uh, the Toronto Pearson International Airport, which I rebranded that airport, created a research portal for customer feedback and information, uh, helped launch the brand, new retail concepts, and also the air service and cargo marketing, where we brought in Emirates, uh, Air China, Etihad, um, Lan Chile, Iceland Air, a whole bunch of different new airlines because we had a lot of empty slots. Um, from there, I left to go into tourism because now I was in that kind of that area on a contract role with Ontario Tourism, which is now called Destination Ontario, where I was the head of uh, the brand and North American marketing. I uh, did that for about two years on contract and then left to start my own business. And my own business is branded, which I'm doing today. Um, and then on the side, I, I decided to do some teaching because I like speaking. And um, and now I'm doing that a little more often than I was when I started. But I both yeah. I branded as a brand strategy and digital strategy firm. that that uh, And I also teach that at uh, Humber College and Centennial College. Very cool. I think I think saying that you're a seasoned marketing vet is an understatement. Certainly. So I, I, yeah, I'm pretty old now. That's for sure. I'm an old man. <laughs> I wasn't going that way with it, but okay. But uh, Ron, I wanted to I wanted to go back to your college pro days for a second and ask you a question about you know the early beginnings to getting into marketing because I find that is that you know it's kind of an intriguing story on how you know you find marketing or how marketing marketing finds you. Right. And, you know, for us, 
it's it's like you know i mean for myself specifically when i was uh i, I found marketing when i was uh, when i had a band in japan and i fe- i realized i like marketing the music more than making and uh creating them performing the music and that was kind of my calling but for you back in the college pro days you know you saw a lot of success in selling and yeah. was it that success that drew you in the direction of marketing or was it something else that drew that, that that pushed you in that direction and made you figure like, hey, I like this this lane, I like this avenue, I'm going to keep going down this path. Yeah. So also in my background, I'm a former national track and field athlete, and I competed, and I like to win. And so I like the highs of doing a campaign, thinking it through strategically, implementing the campaign, and then when it worked, you felt it you got this high and a really great feeling. So that's kind of why I liked it. Um, I also mm-hmm. like sport. And so I try to combine my love of marketing that I had recently recently found I was pretty good at because I was having success with sport. And so that's what I got into. Um, I realized though sport marketing was 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 awesome, but I, um, maybe I was I needed to do something even more rounded, which was the full gambit of integrated marketing communication uh, avenues, which. BBDO really gave me that uh, experience. They gave me the training. I was on big clients and, 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 and as a pretty young guy in huge meetings with, with uh, multiple franchisees, multimillionaires, and different people that I, and they're pretty tough. So I learned how to handle myself in meetings, present well, uh, and, and, you know, really uh, hone in on the skills I needed because you needed to be quick on your feet and, all, and provide a solution that they were happy with in those big meetings I had. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Perfect. Well, you know, again, just to echo what Jay said earlier, thanks a lot for sharing your backstory, Ron. You know, it, you definitely have um, a lot of uh, marketing and business experience, which is uh, super exciting and super cool. And um, you touched on a little bit of everything there as you went through your backstory, but now, you know, moving forward into this Part of the interview, I, I really want to dive deep into um, certain uh, experiences and initiatives that you worked on, um, specifically with you know some of the biggest brands in, in Canada or North America, um, highlighting the specific initiatives as well as how you set them up and, and how they're still running today. So the first one is I really want to touch on uh, Tim Hortons. So your experience at Tim Hortons and ultimately how Camp Day came to be. Sure. So Camp Day is something that my team marketed and executed and would run every day. And everyone's aware of it on some day, usually the first part of June. Mm -hmm. uh, Tim Hortons and all their locations celebrate um, and they raise funds for the Tim Horton Children's Foundation. Um, All the proceeds from coffee sales on that day, as well as selling mini mini, uh, tent, where they're basically paper tents. You put your name on it and donate money or whatever. Um, so that camp day was created by Ron Joyce. I, I didn't create it. Uh, he created it because Ron was the founder with Tim Hortons of Tim Hortons. Uh, Ron was, uh, came from humble beginnings. He, he didn't have a lot of funds. So, and he was always as a kid upset. He couldn't go away on summer camp like all the other kids could. So he decided when he actually had some funds that he would give back and give back to the community. Uh, as a philanthropist so he would do this day and it actually was pretty hard for us to convince him to actually speak about it in our marketing initiatives because he felt he didn't want to blow his own horn it sounded self-serving but what we ended up doing was a a a bunch of consumer focus groups qualitative research across the country to find out how to message it properly and what we learned was people really felt that Tim Hortons was a strong community partner. This is one of those programs on Aided that they would come out and tell us about. But what they said to us was, if you're going to thank, talk about this, don't beat your own horn and say how good you are. Rather, talk about it in a way that thanks your customers and thanks your employees and thanks people and talks about the experiences that the kids get. All that will translate into a better message. And so that's what we did. And we sold that through to Ron. And he bought it, and we were able to then really leverage the day and get it out and market it properly and really help build something that was really important, was the franchise as a local, uh, strong community supporter 
uh, and be known as that across the country. So this was the case, and it really helped um, the organization uh, be seen that way. And we were able to test that in other research, and it really came through loud and clear. And when we did focus groups, post-focus groups, um, what we found out was no matter where we went across Canada, when you ask the question uh, to the various groups, you know, who in your community is a strong corporate support, you know, community partner? Didn't matter where you were. On the, the recipients or the participants in the focus groups would instantly say Tim Hortons. Then they would go on and come explain all the good things Tim Hortons did for the community, including uh, the Timbit sports program and the, you know, smile cookie and the free holiday skating programs and the various programs that, you know, Tim Hortons did. Uh, to support community initiatives, which was a really strong part of their marketing program. And they spent a lot of money on it. And the franchisees were proud of it. And one of the things we also did was, all, you know, Tim Hortons had a long history of franchisees supporting their local community. But what we wanted to do was take all the best programs, put them together, and do them all at the same time and communicate it. And so that we'd have some synergy and be able to talk about it and do PR around it and and some uh, some messaging through uh, various mediums so that we could leverage these days in a better way so that they would be noticed uh, by the communities in which we serve. So really a great, uh, great program. It taught me a lot. Um, and so when I left Tim Hortons, I went to Dairy Queen and they had been supporting the franchisees, the Children's Miracle Network, for about 20 years, but they really weren't 100% committed like Tim Hortons. I mean, when you did Camp Day, 100% of the franchisees would sign up. They'd all do it. They'd dress up their locations, invite the char fire chief, chief in. The employees would be jacked. They would be have their T-shirts on, and they would be pumped. Um, and when we did this, you know, anything for, for the Children's Miracle Network at Dairy Queen, they got 25% participation and, you know, they really didn't raise a significant amount of money. I think at the time when I started, they raised about $223,000 a year, which was really small compared to the $6 million that Tim Hortons raised every year for Tim Horton Children's Foundation. So I went across the country and I said to everybody, look, the franchisee communities and the annual ad swing, Look, you know, we need to do something and we need because we are strong community partners, but we need to do it together. We need to do it. And I'm just going to say this, do what's successful, like what Tim Hortons did. And I had some leverage at that time because Tim Hortons was a very strong brand. They looked up to Tim Hortons and actually the CEO of Tim Hortons, Paul House at the time, was the former head of the Dairy Queen. So they all were really interested in what Tim Hortons was doing. So I said, listen, we're either going to hug whales or. So or hug trees or save whales or whatever we do, but we're going to do something together. But why don't we try and do this right at least once? And why don't we create a day? And so I had thought up at this idea called DQ Miracle Treat Day. Um, yeah. I said, what we need to do is we need to leverage all our ad buys and get some help from all the media. And get, instead of taking bonus spots, when we combine all those bonus spots into like three weeks of support around Miracle Treat Day, something we had done at Tim Hortons. We need to go to our agency, see if they do a free ad for us, a free television ad, which is expensive. A good ad costs at that time three to five hundred thousand dollars. So they agreed and went through all their suppliers and pulled in some favors. Um, we we did the same with the radio and other things, and we we ended up doing the day. We got we ended up not one hundred percent participation, but we got to about ninety eight percent participation. And I set a goal of a million dollars. Well, guess how much we raised on that day? More than a million. Well, yeah, we ended up giving proceeds to all Blizzard sales and we got 1.5 million. So we, we, it was very successful. The mm -hmm. franchisees were thrilled. They, they saw the advantage of it and how much it really created some excitement for the, in the community, but also uh, employee morale at the store level. Um, and so the next year, uh, down in the U.S. at the National Dealer Marketing Council, because in Canada we had 600 franchises, in the U.S. they had close to 7,000 franchises, so a much bigger entity. Uh, they all wanted to hear the story, so I told the story, and then they all got on board. And so today they raise well over $10 million a year for Children's Miracle Networks, where all the funds go 
directly back to the local hospitals where the franchisees are operating their businesses. So quite a, quite a great story. And I got to tell you, it's amazing to see what the funds do and how they help sick children in these hospitals and directly go to these hospitals, research initiatives and for the kids. Uh, on an annual basis, actually, uh, they send Children's Miracle Network children to, um, this, to the Miracle Celebration. And this Miracle Celebration is down at Disney World. Each hospital sends a family. So usually a child with a family. Some send two. Um, they go to this big event there. And, and when you, you know, one of the events they have is they have a room about the size of a football field there in a big hall. Um, and all the sponsors line up uh, and partners, a table and a U, and they sit on the inside of the U. And we all set up their booth and they have autograph books. And so they open the door up and all the kids come through and, and, and you uh, get them to sign your, your book. And they're the, they're the stars. Um, you know, not, not only us was there, but also a lot of uh, people like Steve Aiken was there, NFL football players, uh, different actors and uh, people like that. It was quite, a, quite an amazing event. But the thing that really touched me was meeting the kids. But also when we had this event with all the sponsors, the door was closed and they opened the door with a marching band. And stopped and there was a lady with her child at the front and she started to cry because she couldn't believe that, that what she saw when they opened the door with all these kids and um, everybody in the room started to cry it was quite a touching and an emotional moment and it really stuck with me and that same day this one family came by the booth and they're thanking us for what we had done and I'm saying listen I it's you know I'm just so glad that your child is here today they said well actually uh, John um, Johnny didn't didn't make it, and he's not here with us any longer. And I'm like, oh my gosh! And they said, no, no, no. If it wasn't for you, uh, we wouldn't have had five more years of his life. And he, and we were we were so thankful. And thank you so much. And I said, well, it's not us; it's our customers. Our customers helped us raise these funds. And no, no, we want to thank you. And I'm like, oh my gosh! So it was quite a touching and a, a something that uh, I like to tell the story because when you do a program like that or Camp Day. Um, you're doing it for the right reasons. It's it, You're doing it unselfishly and you're doing it to help. And when you do that and it looks authentic and real, customers notice that and then become real trail or real loyal fans of your brand. And so that's, you know, that's, that's a story I like to tell. And a lot of times I'm asked to speak at conferences and I tell that story and it really resonates with a lot of companies. So it's the right way to do a philanthropic program where the whole company gets involved from the bottom level up. Uh, you can meet all your partners, your employees, your media, your staff, your agency, whoever they are, your suppliers. They all get on board to help you on a day and commit, you know, a hundred percent. And it really helps uh, get this working for you. Yeah, absolutely. And those must have been just absolutely incredible programs to be a part of and kind of make your mark in the marketing world. So just to kind of close the gap uh, between the two experiences. So, you know, when you first um, started out at Tim Hortons, you mentioned that it was Ron Joyce, the founder and CEO of Tim Hortons at the time that uh, came up with the Camp Day uh, idea. And then was it you that he then gave that idea to, uh, to then rally your team around and actually come up and execute on it? It was, but the other program that has actually, I have more of a footprint on is Timbit Sports. So everybody, probably, Dave, have you been a Timbit soccer or hockey player at one time when you were a kid? I was, and you know, it's funny. I was uh, when I first joined um, Timbit Sports uh, in hockey. Uh, I was on the blue Timbits team, nice. and uh, and You're actually, <laughs> yeah, and actually, uh, a few years ago, um, Tim Hortons had uh, gift cards, and on the front of one of the gift cards was a a Timbit player in the blue uh, outfit with the the number eleven, and it was so funny. My mom. Um, bought me that for Christmas that year and, and gave it to me because uh, when I first started playing hockey at age four, I played on the blue team and I was number 11. So it was kind of cool to see like, ah, oh, that was like, that was me uh, when I first started playing. So you want yeah, to hear, well. hear a funny story? That, that yeah. ad, I did that ad. And guess who number okay. 11, guess who the number 11 was? Gary Lehman. No, the little kid. <laughs> oh, I don't know. who it was my son. 
<laughs> really? Well, my On that gift- Mark, who you've met or heard about, yeah. uh, he yeah. and a Laurier grad, grad like you there, Dave, he, yeah. uh, he was the Timbit hockey player that we used in the spot. I had a kid and we could just bring him to the show. If so, only they had Instagram back then. I know. Yeah, honestly, so- that, that is the coolest thing I think I've heard all day. Cause I'm, I'm telling you, honestly, like I, to this day have that uh, gift card um, at home in my nightstand, just, just kind of there to remind me like, yeah, like my mom gave me this, this was me when I was a kid, when I first started playing hockey, um, a sport that I, I grew up to love. Um, but wow, I can't believe that's your son. I'm, I, I, I'm going to tell my mom that that's crazy. You should get him to sign it. <laughs> yeah, I should. I should give it to you to get him to sign. <laughs> there you go. Well, you know, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, I didn't create Timbit Sports. The franchisees have been doing different stuff all the time, but they were doing it for everything, football and soccer and gymnastics and volleyball and tiddlywinks and cheerleading. And it really wasn't resonating. And and so, um, you know, uh, the head of marketing at the time was named Bill Moyer. He came to us and said, and said, Ron, I need you guys to help write a new strategy that really leverages this whole program. So I did, and we picked uh, through some research the two top programs. So the top sport in Canada for kids in terms of participation was soccer. So we decided we're going to do soccer, and we're going to do hockey because that's that's the roots of Tim Hortons. Um, and then we're going to we're going to do the same program in every community, and that same program was from the bottom up. So we would go to the local leagues and we'd buy the leagues out. So you were part of one of those leagues, Dave. Uh, we would say, okay, we're going to we want the you know, the age seven to nine leagues or just the age seven league, whatever the league it was. Um, and we're going to we're going to give everybody a jersey. So you don't have to buy the jerseys. So that that's helpful. In addition, yeah. we're going to give everybody at the end of the year a, a, a medal. So everybody gets a participation medal. And then in some of the communities, we organized jamborees. So jamborees were like a development camp. And we'd bring in our partners at the national level. Olympic athletes or NHL athletes or former NHL athletes to come in and put on clinics for the kids. We also brought the Timbit hockey players down. You, know, per, I th- you may have done this day, actually, where we got them on the Tim Horton Foundation bus. Uh, and then we brought them down to the Leafs game. And at the intermission, uh, after the first first period, the little kids would come out and play a little game, which was really entertaining for the crowd, obviously. And they got to come down on the bus and uh, they got to watch the game and meet meet some Leafs at the end of the game, and they got themselves. They had a they had a really incredible experience. Um, but we did the same formula for soccer. Mm-hmm. Obviously, not down at a Leaf game, but uh, and yes. it really translated. Now other companies have tried to copy us now, like <laughs> like uh, yeah. Scotia Bank. But at the same yeah. time, this is something that we did, and it was quite successful. You did it all at the same time. You made sure you did, every program started at the grassroots bottom level, not the top, not the top down, mm-hmm. but the bottom up, because that got more commitment from the community. And then mm-hmm. we tied in our national buys because we would do television buys. We would buy the broadcast of a uh, uh, hockey night in Canada. Uh, every arena, we bought arena signage. We bought the, we brought, you know, we brought the ads throughout the games and we sponsored some of the various segments they had in the games. Um, and all that like linked into the real program we were really focused, which was the program uh, for kids uh, in the local communities uh, where they where the franchisees really got involved. And, and so that the consumer would, and the parents, part of these kids would see Tim Hortons as a non self-serving, uh, you know, strong community partner. Because the research we sh- saw was, that, I guess, you know, you always have lineups of Tim Hortons. So there was some backlash for, at one time that people thought Tim Hortons was being a little greedy and they were making too much money and there's too many lineups. And so instead, we counteracted that with strong community programs to make sure that the reputation of the organization continued to be strong. Okay, perfect. So, yeah, so I mean, um, perfect. So thanks for clarifying that and, and kind of explaining the uh, the Timbit Sports um, initiative that you had a little bit of a, of a bigger impact on. And then just to just to be clear, then when you went over to Dairy Queen, at that point, you had already established, you know, yourself as as someone that had started a successful initiative for another large brand. And they, they basically brought you in and said, can you do the same thing for us? And at that point it was on you to come up with a unique idea. 
yeah, so that's that's where the Key Miracle Treat Day came about. But also, yeah. you know, one of the things I was even more proud of there was, you know, redoing this old iconic brand. Everybody had been to Dairy Queen as kids, but they needed to take control of the brand and the and control of the franchisee agreements. And and um, Warren Buffett had bought Dairy Queen and said, you know, I want you guys to grow the brand. Uh, renovate stores, change the application, uh, make it more today's, you know, successful in today's world, which was a hard nugget to do because you had to build locations, test locations. Uh, you had to convince current franchisees that had been in the business 40 years to change the way they were doing it, renovate their restaurant or, re, you know, tear it down and build another one or sell it. So it was a pretty tough nut. Um, you know, I didn't do this all myself, but a combination of it was a whole team work with the operations group and the development group. But uh, we helped change the brand and the, the brand offering and what it should look like. We had test markets. Uh, we we uh, had test food. And then eventually we had to change all the, the cooking systems, the grills, everything in all the locations and the branding and the look and feel and then change the way we marketed it. It was quite a big initiative took about to five years to really do it uh but today they're they're operating in that realm they still have some old locations in ontario they're still trying to build up their locations but in other places across canada like in calgary edmonton red deer Kelowna, vancouver uh, halifax and all those other there's strong strong brands with a lot of locations so um so that's right. quite an interesting story. And I was, you know, I did their advertising for about seven, eight years prior to coming on as their back to Dairy Queen on the corporate side uh, as their head of marketing. Wow, perfect. Okay, well, what an incredible first half. Ron, thank you for sharing uh, those experiences with us. We are going to take a very quick break um, and hear from our sponsors for this episode. When we get back from the break, we're gonna go into uh, Ron's experience at Destination Ontario, a little bit about what he's doing today, and then we'll close it off. So we will be right back. And now, a word from our sponsor. This week's episode is brought to you by Merge Media, your one-stop digital shop. Our wide range of services cover all your bases from web design, hosting and SEO to social advertising, PPC advertising, and professional photography. We help our clients reach their goals and become the thought leaders they set out to be. Visit our website today to find out more at merged.ca. Okay, and we are back. Thank you all for sticking around. Uh, before the break, uh, we heard from Ron. He shared a little bit about his, uh, his backstory with us. Um, a former kinesiology student that loves sport and combined his passion with that and, and marketing. Uh, and the rest is history. So we heard about his experience at Tim Hortons on the initiatives of Camp Day and uh, Timbit Sports, uh, and then a little bit about uh, his experience at Dairy Queen and starting the Miracle Treat Day. So, uh, Jay, what do you got for us? Yeah, so so one one thing I want to talk about, Ron, is um, you know a lot of the audience that that is listening to this podcast would be entrepreneurs, small business owners that are looking to get some, you know, they want to get some value from this. And, and I think one of the ways that you can bring that value to the table is giving uh, people sort of an idea on what it's like to sit through kind of a branding session with you, um, you know, starting at the starting maybe at the top where, you know, what does that proposal process look like when you have a lead um, that may potentially want to work with you? Sure. So, um, you know, doing a brand strategy is really a way of, uh, it's more than just a logo, I like to say. So there's a great logo by, a great book by Dave Winter called Brand Ain't the Logo. And it talks about, uh, which I've kind of taken on as my mantra, but really a brand is an operating system. So if you look at a, um, like let's say you're on an ocean and you see a big iceberg and you see on top of the water that iceberg. Um, but that's not the full story of that iceberg. So really, a brand is the whole unit of the iceberg, which below the water. Which, And so above the water, you can represent as what the consumer sees. It's the brand experience. It's the advertising. It's the communication. It's uh, the products. It's 
it's the experience. But below the water is what makes that happen. So all the distribution channels, the uh, the research, the uh, the people, the processes, the training, and all that kind of stuff. So what's really important is that that people look at a brand strategy as a really a way of operating, an operating strategy. Um, and so what I typically do is I ask, I go in with a a, a process of doing a discovery session. That discovery session uncovers, and it's through a, a visual planning session where I uncover some big nuggets for the organization. Um, I get, I ask the right type of questions that gets them to articulate what they think uh, is their challenge, who they think their target audience is, who, what they, th- where they think they're going in three years, what they think their vision is, and and I ask the question a lot of times. You know, if I was to ask your organization what the vision was, could they art- could they all really easily articulate that vision? Usually you get, uh, you create this huge angst and gap because you ask those questions and people kind of say, we actually don't have that. We, we are running, you know, uh, we're entrepreneurs, we're running uh, with our pants on fire and trying to get, you know, drive business. And we really haven't taken time to sit back and figure out where we're going and how the best route to take and, and how we should be communicating this. And so that usually leads to them asking for a proposal. The proposal is broken down into four key areas. One is in phases, which is really the process that um, I would do as part of a branded uh, strategy session. For the first uh, phase, is called branded understanding. That first phrase, we do a brand audit of all the materials, how things are being communicated. Um, I do interviews with key stakeholders and partners. Um, I look at past research um, and that's called clean slating. So a lot of times organizations will do a lot of, a lot of research and they get the research company in, they present the research, qualitative or quantitative research, and that goes back on the shelf and they, you know, if you go back to that research, it hasn't been opened up since the day they actually did the research. So a lot of times what I do is I sniff through that research and I find some key nuggets. And then I do some, some other secondary research online and really help put together a report in that main phase with all the interviews, the past research, the different things. And then I do a summary of where we think we need to go for the next phase, which is phase two, which is the development phase. So branded development really is where uh, I take that. Um, It may require us to do some more quantitative and qualitative research. Um, And then I lead, take all that information in the phase two into a a brand, real branded discovery session, which is a two day meeting where we do visual planning exercises, where we look at all areas of the business, external, internal, competition, research. Uh, We do a uh, spot analysis as well as a whole competitive analysis together. Uh, We do brainstorming sessions. And at the end of the session, we walk away with five key bold steps on what the organization needs to do. Uh, to progress to the next level to where they want to go. We also do a visionary session where we're voting on various uh, aspects of where they need to go from a vision perspective. And we determine, based on the research and based on their input, an air, the area of the business that they need to differentiate based on their brand attributes. So we have a survey we do which covers kind of the key brand attributes, and that kind of helps determine which ones they are firing the highest on, and then we vote as a group on the area we need to, uh, different areas of uh, focus to really have their brand stick out amongst their competition. An example of that I'll give you uh, is like with um, uh, when we did the, I did the brand strategy for, um, uh, uh, for a company called Javelin Technology. So Javelin is a 3D design and firm that trains organizations in um, SolidWorks software, which is a 3D application software um, that's used in in a number of different ways. It's used in medical training and education to teach people how to operate on baby tiny hearts because you you can print out a baby heart and you you can have students operate on those hearts to uh, various parts of a car 
these 3D printing is really, really cool. So that whole process, we were able to, to really highlight what made Javelin different than some of their competitors. And what made them different was uh, they were seen as a real facilitator of knowledge uh, so that they would they were really f- needed to start focusing in on solving solutions for their clients. So they would sell the software, but then they were able to show them how to use it, do training sessions, follow up, do proper uh, uh, sessions with them so that they were, the application of their software was actually being used properly. Um, and that was all determined in this, this development stage where we determined that, that this knowledge seeking was a really important attribute that they needed to have satisfied from their customer base. The other thing we do in this phase is we probably do, if they don't have it, uh, further research. So we might do a segmentation study on the various target segments that we should be going after. Um, uh, They they might do uh, focus groups or whatever. But overall, uh, it can be a very, uh, very intense session. By the end of it, uh, they get delivered a brand brand strategy with vision brand attributes, a mission statement, values, uh, I call brand DNA, which is their focus. And that all leads down to uh, a tagline. And then the last thing <laughs> on the list is, is a logo or a, a, a change in, in, in image with their logo, if they even desire that or need that. So it's a real strategic exercise. From there, we do brand iconography, so imaging and messaging. So for the brand, so that uh, they, as an organization, uh, can all c- communicate in a consistent fashion in their marketing materials and their digital and social messaging that they're doing and how they speak to their customers and their customer service. Um, and at the end of the day, we create also create up, uh, we do that very specifically. So that's the development section. We then go into activation. In activation, a lot of companies, I either coach them along the way with their brand or they ask me to partner with them and to do their marketing plan and start to activate digital and social programs. Uh, and my those programs, I usually partner with people like yourself, like Merged, uh, used to be Fresh Crowd. Um, and we work together with the client. Uh, we set up key metrics in the plan that we've created or and uh, we measure those ongoing and quarterly to make sure that we are on track and helping being successful. So the four phases, as I mentioned, are understanding, branded development, branded activation, and then branded metrics, which is uh, the way that we monitor and uh, make sure that we are on track. A lot of times, too, I'll set up a brand scorecard. That scorecard is measured as well, and then we port that back to the the various stakeholders in the organization, which could be anything from the, uh, the board to the senior executive group or shareholders. Um, And that's done so that we can show some advancement on that. The work that we did actually has changed the organization. Um, The same process was used when I helped redevelop the brand um, at Toronto Pearson International Airport. So the GTAA had the same problem. They, uh, They had a brand called the GTAA and they had Toronto Pearson International Airport. Instead, we really wanted to create a, a, a clear message that the brand was one brand, which is we changed it to um, uh, Toronto Pearson, um, rebranded it, created a, an image and messaging that they needed to do and a new tagline. Uh, and then we used all that to help launch a further development strategy of you know new retail locations in the place and new experiences. Uh, which were done through the research process we had done. So we did a lot of research, actually over a million dollars of research there, but we figured out that we needed to create uh, programs that satisfied the most profitable year, uh, users of the airport, the ones that were using the airport. And then we also needed to satisfy those that came less frequently with different uh, retail initiatives, programs, and experiences. And so the research was used to help uh, figure out new innovations. So for the really... Uh, you know, those customers that were, we called them suits on the fly, but they were individuals that flew a lot. Um, we ended up creating, uh, and they really, these, these uh, passengers really didn't like flying because they were out, they flew over 130 days of the year. They were uh, heavy users of the brand at the airport. They were there a lot. They spent a lot of money there. 
Uh, but they didn't like flying. They were tired of it. And so we tried to create programs to ease their travel experience, including uh, front of the line programs at check-in, front of the line programs at security with a partnership with American Express and Air Canada, where if you were an elite member, you could get right to the front of the line. We created some specialized lounges. If you had an elite card for Air Canada or an American Express platinum card, you could go into the premium lounges and have free access to food and you could relax. Um, we, we created programs uh, that allowed you to get on the plane sooner. And then also when you arrived, uh, we, you got your bag sooner. And then you also, um, your, your car was valet parked. So when you showed up, your car was already warm and ready to go when you got off the plane. So all that was, was done through the marketing process and the research process of identifying consumer needs and wants and behaviors. And then reacting by creating programs that address those needs and wants in a way that uh, allowed passengers to feel it had a better experience, which equated into them spending more money at the airport. So I think it's, you know, I think it's eye-opening, eye Ron, you know, especially for a lot of smaller businesses, small to medium-sized businesses out there that don't understand what exactly it means to look under the hood of their business and understand that target audience and go into the level of depth. Um, that you do with a client. Now, you know, with all that being said, um, you know, what happens when it comes to the time for an execution plan and how much of the, the execution plan is on the actual client to fulfill? And, and, and you know what I mean? Because you're coming to the plate with all these strategies, but there is a level of, of work or effort that needs to be done on the client's end, correct? Yeah. And so there's a term that is used uh, by a, a research firm I've worked with called TNS Research. They're, they're owned by Kantar. They're a global research firm. It's called brand consistency. And so what's really important is that, that mm. especially a service organization, say you have a small restaurant or uh, you know, a couple locations or a client that I have called Colorworks, that they, right. they're able to deliver a consistent experience for every customer when they come in the door so that, that when they – they, they're able to deliver against the brand promise. So if they're promising something, how right. often can you say that you actually saw that in their advertising? So, um, so Ron, I mean, the question becomes, because you're so thorough and, and a lot of small to medium-sized business owners, they, you know, they don't understand the level of depth that you go into to understand their brand, their audience, and the strategy for implementation. Um, and, you know, I think for them, you know, there is a level of effort that needs to happen on their end when you have a strategy that you want to push forward. And, um, and, and how does that how does that work? Like, what's the level of expectation that that is to be done on their end? Well, it's, it's really important that any smaller business uh, can deliver a consistent brand experience from the, you know, the reality is your customer is, is, should be thinking about the eye of your customer. They're always watching what you're doing. Right. So. Um, if you're going to create a vision and you're going to create the process that I've said, you got to make sure that you're able to deliver on the brand promise and to deliver a consistent experience time after time. That's why brands like Tim Hortons have, you know, been successful because they, they spend a lot of time ensuring that their, a, that their processes and the way they serve products and services to their customers, like the coffee is served the same way, the same time, every time. And so, um, what smaller businesses need to do, and I'll give you an example, is one of my customers is uh, Colorworks. They're an auto body repair shop, and uh, they do scratches and dings in the express service, and they also do, uh, you know, co full collision repair. Um, they, you know, have operations in Ontario, Alberta, and BC, but they're kind of far apart. But what they need to do, and we've been able to do through a new brand strategy is have consistent messaging, consistent approach in the delivery and execution of that. You know, our uh, social media agency we work with, uh, that I partner with, which is Merged, of all people, uh, they're able to translate that strategy we created into the same imagery, the same type of messaging on all the various uh, local social media channels that they have signed up from. Each location has a Facebook and an Instagram channel, for example. Um, and what we do is we monitor that ongoing to make sure that, uh, and I help them with that, to make sure that we are on track and we don't go sideways. We don't have a different approach or the wrong messaging. At the store level, 
um, we have to make sure that all the brands are represented consistently. So the brand I hierarchy included different signage for the type, two different types of locations they have. So they have a auto body location and they have a um, express location. And the auto body location, they have a certain uh, way that the brand is represented. And then in a consistent and matching way with the express, but a little bit different. Uh, and so the internal imagery in the express is all around you know, delivering peace of mind and fast and the messaging in, and the imagery that goes with that. And the messaging in the store is really about, you know, you know, you know, putting your life back into balance and, and delivering peace of mind after an accident. And so, you know, both messages are similar and consistent, but we have to make sure that we deliver that uh, at the operations level so that people are trained, they understand what's appropriate in terms of how to deliver the messaging at the store level, or that when they're doing local marketing, that they also follow on their own, the, fall, the, the, the you know, the proper logo usage is colors, the proper images, the right type, type of messaging, um, that they're training their staff that way. And that's so that they're all kind of singing from the same song sheet. And so really a brand strategy relating down to activating that brand is an ongoing effort. And you have to make sure that there's, there's uh, points in time where you're ch checking back and making sure that everybody's doing it and they're on track and you're consistently doing it. And you can also involve your customers by doing informal surveys and making sure they're saying, you know, what are you seeing when you come in and what are you feeling when you're coming in uh, to our locations and the staff, that, the staff as well. That's talk, another place. Yeah. Let's talk about that for a second. Uh, Ron is, you know, being in 2020 and, you know, talking about modern marketing and obviously customers have options now when they go to look for a certain product or service, right? So um, you just brought up surveys, um, which kind of triggered that, um, you know, it's, it's including the customer nowadays, you know, with the flyers now kind of being obsolete um, and, and other marketing methods, just not as effective as they used to be. Do you find that, you know, the way things trend and, and how quickly things change and you have to adapt for yourself, being a seasoned marketing um, marketing person, is it frustrating or is it exciting for you? Well, I think the only thing that's really changed is that marketing used to be a reach medium. So you would do marketing and advertising and you'd reach a large group of people, right? Um, and you'd hope that someone in your target audience saw your message. You know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. And so that's gone by the way. So it's more much more targeted and micro today, where you can pin pin out people with the right types of behaviors. So it's more efficient. It's more targeted in terms of specific approaches, and so the channels help reach people based on the the technology that you're allowed to use to access various people. Um, so the strategy hasn't changed, or the approach or the method, but the mediums and have changed and have become more finite. And also, which I like, allow you to measure if you're having an impact or not. I mean, in the old days, you'd do a television ad and spend a million bucks and reach 90% of the population base, 18 to 49, but you couldn't, you didn't know unless you did have expensive research afterwards, if you actually reached the right people, if they remembered the ad, if they engaged in the ad, um, and the only way you knew is that people from a, if it was a retail location, like a Dairy Queen, if people ran into the stores and started buying tons of blizzards and, you know, hamburgers and Sundays and things. That's the only way you knew because you, you couldn't do a direct relation like today where you do something, you can measure the, uh, the impressions, you can measure the, the engagement levels, and you can measure, measure conversions, so actually people buying products and services. So um, the strategy's not changed, but the mediums have and the, and then how you can really track people and and uh, use the technology to further target even more specifically. Yeah, perfect. So before we get into wrapping up here, I just want to kind of close the loop on something I was wondering because I know Jason brought up small and medium sized business owners and businesses um, a couple times, and you know earlier when you were going through your entire um, process, which is quite complex uh, and impressive. It starts with the discovery session uh, and then leads into the, you know, four key phases, um, five key bold steps, brand strategy, and then logo, you know, for, for a business that is 
doing maybe 500 to a million in revenue per year and maybe only has a couple of employees, you know, would you, would you suggest that they go through the same sort of process or is there one that is a little bit more scaled back that uh, someone like that, a small company like that would be able to, to implement to, to maybe better define their messaging um, maybe come up with a new tagline or new logo or something like that so that they can ultimately grow into something that is much larger and, and would require maybe something that was as in depth as you, as you mentioned earlier. Well, that's a good point. You actually, you scale things quite a bit back. So the phases still remain intact. So in discovery, you'll still do interviews with key stakeholders or employees of the company. You'll st- you know, mm. and you might look at any get information by just doing a good uh, questioning period with all of them. The planning session would be a visual planning session. So you don't have much other research. You may have some customer surveys or something, but really it's coming from the people and the employees of the organization. You might send mm. an internal employee survey opposed to a broad based consumer survey that doesn't cost you much, but you're getting information of what people who use them talk to the customer every day what they think. Um, the plan's the same. You still need a plan, um, but the budgets are smaller, so you're going to therefore uh, you know, use more secondary research, studies that are also out there to help support your case and your direction that you're going to use. Um, and then the implementation, you really want to devise tactics that are going to clearly access your target group uh, efficiently you're going to make sure that you're be able to be nimble enough to adapt so that if the programs aren't working online, that you're able to change them and adjust them and or change the channels that you're on or the approach that you're doing. Um, you need to, it's a similar approach, but it's smaller scale in terms of the amount of information that you would be able to gather in terms of spending money on consumer research. And I find actually in Canada, a lot of companies don't have a big appetite for a lot of consumer research and they, they usually scale that part back, which, um, yeah. you know, bigger brands would spend a lot of money on, for example. Perfect. Well, yeah, thank you for clarifying that. I think that's important because, you know, a lot of the people that might be listening out there do have smaller businesses. Maybe it's just themselves and a partner or um, one or two employees. So, um, you know, I'm glad we were able to clarify for you that uh, you can you can engage your company in something like this to really define uh, who your brand is, what you want it to be uh, and and kind of move the move the needle forward. So thank you very much, Ron. And, and you know, thank you again for being on the uh the show today we really really appreciate um all your your knowledge and your stories it was really cool to hear um and for those that are listening today that would like to get in touch with you ron what's the best way to do so yeah well so you can go to to my website which is uh brandedstories.org so it's easy to find and you can connect with me there or you can uh or you can call me at 647-466-9717. But the best place is just go to my website. and, and uh, set up on I actually do some free discovery sessions to, to help people figure out their, their digital brand or their brand. And uh, there's a place to do that on there. Perfect. Well, thank you. And and for listeners, please reach out to Ron. Uh, if anything at all today intrigued you and you want to find out more, and um, obviously we'd love to hear from you as well. So please reach out, reach out to us on social. We're at, at Merge Media. Our website is merge.ca. Um, and if you have any questions or would like to be in the podcast, please email podcast at merge.ca. Okay, Ron, th- we end every single uh episode with the same question okay and that question is um if you could choose one person dead or alive to represent your brand who would it be and why and i think this is interesting because you work for some some very large brands uh in your in your career so perhaps there was someone famous or or someone very influential that you reached out to in the past whether it be with tim hortons or dairy queen um that you wanted to represent their brand and uh and and who would that have been and why yeah i think the person that sticks out the most is a guy named lee clow so lee clow is a famous advertiser that I worked with when, you know, creating the Palladium brand. He worked for Shia Day, which is, then became TWA. Uh, when I met him, he um, uh, he had a long beard and 
he actually has a Twitter account called, uh, I think it's called Lee's, Lee Cloud's Beard. But, but um, <laughs> Lee, uh, Lee is the inventor of the Apple brand. So obviously Steve Jobs and Wanicki did it, but he was the one that came up with the Apple, the brand, the experience, the logo, how to communicate it, all the messaging, the ads that they did. Um, and so he taught me a really an important lesson. So when we were thinking about Palladium, he came to and we're trying to figure out how we're going to represent this new entertainment product to the consumer. He says, Ron, once you figure out how you fit into people's lives every day, you'll figure out that and you'll figure that out. So I've used that in a lot of my different uh, um, career experiences and different brands I've worked with. So, and, and it's actually true. Fitting into how you fit into your brand fits into people's lives is a critical element. And it gives you a lot of insight and allows you to, to think of a new ideas, new thoughts, new processes and ways to communicate the brand. So I guess Lee I'm Kamal sure. is the one that I would, that I would be the guy. What I'd like and to do. So. Down a paper while David asked you that question. Um, I thought you were going to pick the great one. <laughs> well, he was a great, uh, uh, yes. Um, you know, I met him uh, at a shoot. By the way, oh, no, the great one is Gretzky. Go ahead, Ron. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's, that's, that's Wayne Gretzky, yeah. Um, I met American him because list. I was at a McDonald's shoot. And we were doing the shoot and the head of McDonald's marketing, Rem Lang, and said, Ron, do you want to meet Wayne? And I said, I, you know what, Wayne, you know what? I don't need to meet Wayne Gretzky. It's okay. It's fine. I'm here to do the job. I got out, got, you know, crews here and production companies, and we got to make sure the spot comes out right. He goes, Ron, come with me. You're meeting him. So yeah. I had to go. So I went to this trailer where you do the big television spots and we opened up the trailer, went in the trailer, we sat down. And Rem goes, okay, this is Wayne, this is Ron, Ron, this is Wayne, Ron, Ron, this is Mike Barnett, who was his agent. And Rem goes, nice, nice seeing you again, Wayne. I'm, I'll talk to you guys later. And closed the door and left the trailer. So I was there alone in the uh, in the trailer with Wayne Gretzky, this the guy that was like the icon. This is 1999, so he was. It was the year before he retired, um, and he was quite famous, obviously, and. I had remembered that he knew my wife. So my wife used to live in Edmonton. So I said, yeah, my wife, uh, her, she used to work for um, uh, a firm called Bunting Waring. That they're a, a, a brokerage firm. And you used to be part of that and uh, used to invest there. And you used to, she used to hang out with your ex-girlfriend, Vicky Moss. And he looks at me and goes, Gene Bean. <laughs> So, so Gene Bean is that that was her nickname, I guess. I went, oh, so you knew her well, and we all started laughing, and that kind of broke the ice. And I realized just how humble this guy was, and how uh, normal guy he was. And he started talking to me like I was his buddy, and uh, he started telling the story of the Salt Lake Olympics, where they came down to a shootout to go to the gold medal game. And they didn't put him in to do the shootout. And he was sitting on the bench sulk sulking. And they showed that on the air on, on CBC Sports. And, uh, but, you know, he was still upset about that the year before in 98 that he hadn't been put in. Because he said, I'm sure I could have uh, scored and won the game. So. But anyway, he was very yeah. humble, very nice guy. And other projects, uh, he became a friend. I was able to call him when I worked at Palladium to uh, – uh, come and create a, a real hockey game, uh, which he helped us with, him and his agent. And he put his name on it and uh, a, a virtual game that was. And so, yeah, he was a really great guy and a uh, real authentic Canadian and a really humble athlete. He was not full of himself, that's for sure. Cool. That's great. And, and yeah, you're right. I'm sure he would have scored that goal. And I actually just recently saw Tim Horton's ad on TV and uh, he's in it. So um, it sounds like you missed the boat on that one for Tim's, but that's all right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. All so, right. So uh, thanks a lot, Ron. Really appreciate you uh, joining us today. Um, that's it for today. Thanks, Ron. Thanks, guys. Well, how about that, eh? Ronnie Coglin. Yeah, come on the show. You know, he's a, you know, a branding vet. I think if there was a branding Hall of Fame, he'd probably be <laughs> it, right? Um, he'd be named after him. That way, he's he's got uh, he's got a lot of experience. Quite the stories. So he's he's got the resume yeah. for sure. And and you know what? I think what's what a lot of people don't understand is the level of depth that somebody like that goes into to mm -hmm. really dissect mm -hmm. your business. 
mm-hmm. you know, and, 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 you know, put the pieces back together. Yeah. If any, if, if there's any small and medium sized business that is strongly rec- thinking about doing a rebrand, mm-hmm. um, he's definitely a type of guy that you'd want to seek out, um, you know, because this is what he does, you know, this is his thing. This is what he's done for 30 plus years, you know, where, uh, you know, and he's a professional with it. He knows exactly uh, what to do to make you, you know, to rebrand your business and, and get the right message in front of that audience. Absolutely. And I mean, you know, this brand strategy work is really a unique stream of marketing that um, not everybody can can easily pay, pick up on. It takes a lot of research. Um, you can tell by his, you know, explanation of his process that he goes through when he sits down with a company to come up with a new brand like it must take months so, uh, yeah, he's got a lot of experience and, and I mean, obviously from the stories that you heard today, he, he's really helped out a lot of big and small brands, um, take it to the next level and really define who they are. So, uh, now, you know, the common denominator between Tim Hortons camp day and DQ miracle tree. You day. really like that. Eh? Oh, I love it. <laughs> especially, especially now that I know the story behind the, uh, the gift card with, uh, uh, quote unquote me on it. That's so cool. Yeah. All right. See you next week. Take care.